You are listening to the Luis Palau Legacy Library. Luis loved the Bible. It was unmistakable in every message he preached. May this teaching inspire you to delight in God's Word and draw near to the author of life. I praise the Lord this morning for the good weekend we've had together. As you remember, without uh, doing any more uh, introductions, I'm wishing you all a wonderful trip home and a great year in serving the Lord Jesus Christ, serving the church, and trying to win other people. Remember, write out your testimony in 300 words or less so you can give it over a cup of coffee and yet have all the essentials there, maybe one Bible verse in your testimony that will make an impact. Uh, But remember, we were talking about the life of the Apostle Paul and how he lived in the world of the supernatural. I want to be reminded of that just as we leave. From the day he was converted, which was an amazing encounter with the living Christ, where a light shines from heaven, he gets blinded, he falls off his donkey, everybody hears the sound but couldn't hear the words, and those who surrounded him, apparently none of them were converted on the spot, at least, that we know of, but the Apostle Paul was. And uh, from then on, all his life, the Holy Spirit revealing things to him, going up to the third heaven to understand the things that then the Holy Spirit led him to put in writing so that we could benefit today and how the Lord fulfilled his promise in John when he said the Spirit of God will come and remind you everything I told you and will teach you of things to come, things to come. And so we have the Apostle Paul had a very clear-cut conversion. Remember that? Then the second day he had a clear-cut lifestyle. All his life was a Spirit-filled lifestyle. And now we battle with temptation. We didn't quite get into that. It's more than you can do in just three and four sessions or three and a half sessions. But uh, the apostle was not perfect. He battled sin. Romans 7 says, oh, wretched man. That's what a word, huh? Wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Sin and the old nature doesn't change. And it's there till we go to heaven. And then thirdly, yesterday, we talked about the mission that Paul did many good deeds. God used him to heal people, laid hands on them, even on his way to Rome at the end of his life. It was his last trip that he ever had. And you remember the island where the shipwreck took place? Mr. Plubius, who owned a lot of land on the island of Malta, was sick and he raised him from the dead and the fever left him. And everybody who was sick on the island during those three months, I think it was, or five, on the island of Malta, There was all sorts of miracles happening. So Paul lived in the world of the supernatural. And even at the end of the race, the last chapter that we have that he wrote from jail in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, he he says, you know, everybody deserted me, but the Lord stood by my side. And it was more than just a presence, you know, that we all experienced. I think there was uh, the Lord coming right next to him and saying, Paul, I am here. Everybody else has run away, but I haven't left you. So to the very end, the Apostle Paul lived in the world of the supernatural. And then the last point I want to make this morning, I, uh, I want us to think about this. He had a clear-cut sense of expectation. He lived in, with two things, what's going to happen the next few years on earth, but also the expectation of an eternity that begins for the believer at the second coming of Jesus Christ, or if he doesn't come back before our time, we die and go to be with the Lord. So the Apostle Paul lived with this. And you know, this concept of the second coming of Christ has become kind of passe in Christian circles, even biblical circles, evangelical circles, faithful circles. There are some people who mock the idea some people who make remarks even from pulpits and Bible conferences. Well, you know, it's so, uh, you know, it's complicated and there's a lot of opinion, so let's just forget it. Well, any subject that is mentioned 300 times in the Bible is not something that you dismiss lightly, you know. Some of the themes in the Bible are mentioned two, three, four times. The second coming, the return of the Lord is so important that it's mentioned about 300 times, the theologians tell us repeatedly. In fact, some say 400, but let's keep it to three. 300 times. You know, that's a lot. That's the next step for the believer. So let's read a few passages and then a few comments with a few illustrations, and then you are ready to depart with the thought of that. You know, the Apostle Paul ends uh, his last epistle, again, 2 Timothy chapter 4, where he says, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, 
I have kept the faith. And now there is a waiting for me. Listen to this. The crown of righteousness, which the Lord has promised to me, and not only to me, but to all those who love his appearing. All those who love the second coming. All those who love the concept, Jesus is coming again. And for the believer, it's a daily thing. If you really love the Lord Jesus Christ, that's why I love the King James translation on that verse. The NIV puts it a little differently. What does it say? I just don't think it's as powerful as the King James. And that happens, of course, many times. But it says, to all those who, uh, who long for his appearing, that's fine, long for it, but love his appearing. The Apostle Paul lived in the atmosphere. Jesus could come today. And you know, we're supposed to do that. When you go off to do your hedge fund in New York, as you see the sun or the clouds or the, the snow in New York, you say, Lord, perhaps today, perhaps today you're coming back. And while I'm doing some trade in a stupid desk, I'm gone. What a blessing. Leave it all behind for the pagans to handle your accounts afterwards, you know? Uh, or uh, whatever you may be doing back in the, at the ranch, wherever you are, every day we should be able to look at it that way. So let's first of all then begin with Philippians chapter 1. Paul is writing from jail again, and he's thinking about life on earth as long as it should last, and then the assurance of heaven when, he, when the Lord calls him home, whether by the second coming or by death. In the case of the Apostle Paul, it was death. But perhaps we'll be alive the day Jesus comes back. I long for that. In 2 Corinthians 5, the Apostle Paul says, I hope that I can skip the death thing and be taken off to be with the Lord. But it didn't happen. Okay, so Philippians 1, just as brief as we can, 18 to 24. 18. Philippians 1, 18. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is being preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. But what shall I choose? I don't know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but... It is more necessary for you that I should remain in the body. Let's stop right there. So just for a second, the apostle is writing one of his last epistles, as far as we know, letters from jail. And he says, you know, I know that I'm facing death. He said, I'm ready. I'm ready. In fact, if I had a choice, I would rather depart and go to be with Christ. Go ahead, chop off my head, and I'm going straight into the presence of Jesus Christ. But on the other hand, he says, if it is more significant and valuable for you, then I will remain on earth. So keep praying, keep asking the Lord. And he expected that he would stay on earth for a while longer. You can tell that from the context. But nevertheless, the point is double. That in, in his mind, his expectation was, I think I'm going to get out of jail. And I think I'm going to bless the Philippians as well as others, probably. But he said, I'm ready to go. If it was my choice, I'm ready right now. I'd just rather depart and be with Christ. It's better by far. And that verse means a lot to me as some old timers who know me well is because my father, when he went to be with the Lord, quoted that passage. I'm going to depart and be with Jesus, which is better by far. And he was gone. I mean, that is a great passage to keep before you when you're sick, when you realize that death is coming close, how good to know what we know. The Apostle Paul saw these things revealed by Jesus Christ himself, probably during those three years in Arabia, although it isn't said so in the Bible, but most of us theologians and others feel it happened during those three years when he was taken up to the third heaven and he saw things that is not lawful to repeat. Some other things, yes, were lawful. So 
The second passage, if you don't mind, it's a beautiful one. Second Corinthians chapter five. Second Corinthians chapter five. And again, the apostle is writing this second letter. It's a little later in life, not yet from jail. Uh, I think this one was written when he was on the road uh, towards Corinth, and he advanced his visit by writing 2 Corinthians, also to straighten out some problems that were going on over there. So here we go, chapter 5, just verses 1 through uh, 9, okay? Now we know that if the earthly tent that we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we don't wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose, and has given us the Spirit listen to this, as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come, that is, heaven and the new body. Therefore, we are always confident, and we know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So, we make it our goal to please Him, whether we are at home in the body or away from the body. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due to him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Well, that passage deserves a whole message in itself. But the gist of it is very plain, where the apostle is saying, okay, we are bound in this body. St. Peter, in one of the epistles, calls the body the tent the tent that we live in, and Paul does also. And he says, so we are living, this is a temporary residence, our soul and our spirit, the real us. We dwell in this tent called the body. One of these days, the tent will fold up and the body will die. And it goes into the ground and disintegrates. But the soul and the spirit goes to be with the Lord. That's why the King James, again, let's face it, the King James wasn't all that bad. Yes, it had old time wording that makes it a little tongue-tied for some of us. But here in verse 8, it says, we are confident and say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. The King James puts it so nicely, absent from the body, present with the Lord. That's the way closer to the Greek. It's very clear. You leave the body, you're with the Lord. Bang, bang. There you go. No, bang. Only once. You leave the body and you're with the Lord. It's one instant. And it's so exciting. My mother-in-law, Elsie Schofield, she was in a retirement home and all by herself. No, we live close to home and most of us visited her and so on. But I remember one day, I think I was alone with her. And she said, you know, Louise, I'm ready. I want to go home. And it wasn't long after that she went home. And you know, for the believer, what a glorious thing that is. And the Apostle Paul, he had a clear-cut expectation. If I'm on earth, I've got a ministry, and I'm ready for it. But if you ask me for my preference, I'd rather depart and be with Jesus and get it over with. And you know, the interesting thing about this passage is study it because every word is worth gold. And you, if you read too many theological books, you can get confused. It's funny. When you read the Bible, you get much more unconfused. I liked Ian Thomas. Ian Thomas, I quoted him before. My old timers have to listen to these repetitious things. But, you know, old, old people repeat things because they think it's worth repeating, you know, not because they are senile. And I'm not, for sure, am I? No. I like Ian Thomas. He said this. Listen carefully because it's a catchy thing. I find that the Bible throws a lot of light on the commentaries. Now, I meditate on that one, you know. Commentaries are supposed to explain the Bible. Many times the Bible has to explain the commentaries because, you know, systematic theology is quite different from biblical theology, you'd be surprised to know. Systematic theology, you start with a theory and you develop it and pick verses. And many times you say, where did this come from? It ain't in the Bible. Where did this guy get it? Oh, he got it from Calvin. Oh, who's Calvin? Well, a guy who died 500 years ago. Oh, good. I'd rather know what the Lord says. And the Apostle Paul says over here, we have a house in heaven, not made by human hands. And that's where we long to go. And when we leave the body, we go to that heavenly house, which God prepared 
not man, God. And yet there are people today trying to change the whole concept. In you know, heaven is right, right next door, or heaven will be when we come down. No, the Bible clearly, and every time the Bible talks about heaven, it says it's up there. It's up there. He wants us to think. He's coming in the clouds to take us to be with himself. Don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, here it comes, I will come again and take you to be with me so that where I am, there you may be also. One of the apostles said, Lord, where are you going? We don't know. And then Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Get it straight in your hearts and minds because one of these days we'll all get old. Not yet, but we will eventually. And we've got to know and know what the Scripture, and Paul lived in this. That's how he was able to be in jail and be able to rejoice and write that epistle. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith and I love his appearing. And the Lord is going to give us a crown for those who love his appearing. You know, I fear that many true believers do not love his appearing. And you know, when you don't have the doctrine and the teaching that Paul lived in about his coming again, you know what happens? You become very earth-oriented rather than have the vision of eternity and the balance that that brings. Yes, we enjoy life, but it's only 70, 80. Okay, go ahead and live to be 100 if you're really anxious. But after that, it's over. And many young believers today who don't pay attention to what the apostle lived in and had this clear-cut expectation, as long as I'm on earth, I will bless you and serve you. But I'm ready to go, and I know where I'm going because faithful is he who calls you. He will also do it. So that's the second passage. Now I got too enthused on that. Uh, first, first Thessalonians chapter 4, okay? So that here's the apostle Paul again by the Holy Spirit. Most of you know these passages very well. So verse 13 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 4. This is the apostle Paul, brothers and sisters, speaking by the Holy Spirit. Don't forget that. He's not shooting his mouth. He's not sitting there creating a theology. This was revealed by the Holy Spirit to Paul. So here we go. Brothers, we don't want you to be ignorant. There's a lot of ignorance about this. About those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive on our left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. What a beautiful passage and how the Lord spells it out. It matches John 14 to a T, and it also matches 1 Corinthians 15. And I'd like you to turn to this 1 Corinthians 15, because I'd rather you go home blessed and inspired by the glorious promises of God than by a few comments that I could ever make. 1 Corinthians 15, we're going to have to tighten it up a bit, but... Um, Let's look at verses. Oh, it's such a temptation to read the whole chapter because it's glorious, connected with the resurrection, and then the questions arise. So let's begin then with verse 35. Read 15 on the plane because it'll bless you beyond words, and it is Sunday morning when we especially remember the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here we go. Someone may ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish! What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed he gives his own body. All flesh is not the same, 
Men have one kind of flesh, animals another, birds another, and fish another. There are also heavenly bodies, and there are earthly bodies, but the splendor of the heavenly bodies is of one kind, and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon another, and the stars another, and star differs from star in splendor. So will be at the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. That phrase there means a soulish body, a body adapted to the soul. They call it natural because there's just not, not a specific word in English. It is raised a spiritual body, a body adapted to our spirit. So the earthly body that we now have is adapted to our soul mostly. The uh, resurrection body will be adapted to the spirit. There is a natural body. There's also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual doesn't come first, but the natural. And after that, the spiritual. Well, let's jump now to verse uh, 51. And not to despise the passage, but to shorten it, okay? Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we all will be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. I see the hand of the Holy Spirit, obviously, but it's kind of nice to observe it. And how he ends the chapter, although it wasn't a chapter in those days, how he ends the paragraph. He's talking about the resurrection of Christ, the glorious Sunday morning when Jesus rose from the dead. Then he begins to talk about our resurrection. Then he talks about the body we'll have, the resurrection body that will be like his body, in Philippians, it says that he will raise the body of, of our weakness to be like his resurrection body. And 1 John chapter 2, this is John now, 3, he says, you know, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. So it's going to be a glorious moment. It'll be a new body. No more death, no more crying, no more sickness, no more tears. It'll be a body adapted to the spirit. There's mystery there, but there's enough to know. And a spiritual mind gets it. You don't have to argue about it. You accept it and you say, hallelujah. There's a new body coming. And all our loved ones, huh? My dad, shush, you know, 60-some years. My mother-in-law, six, seven, I can't remember anymore. My mom, probably 15. And loved ones that have gone. Their bodies are in a grave somewhere. They themselves are in the presence of the Lord, alive to the Lord, worshiping the Lord, their soul and their spirit in the presence of the throne of God. When you read Revelation, isn't that exciting? It says that there are thousands and thousands and 10,000 times 10,000 <laughs> bowing before the throne of God and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. What a pain. I try to imagine my dad. I'm kind of selfish and silly, but hey, I like to think my dad's in the crowd somewhere. Can I see him? You know, I can't yet, but I will see him. And what a glorious thing it is to know that there is heaven up ahead, the whole concept. The world is interested in what's happening in the world today, and we ignore it. What a silly and bad thing to do for our children's sake, for the future of the church. We need to look seriously at the teaching of the Word of God, which is, yes, it's deep, and it's at points you don't get all the answers you want, but there's enough there to give us comfort and peace and joy and excitement and even the longing I've told this story, but I'm going to tell it again. I found out when I was in Scotland who it was who said it. It was a fellow called Andrew Bonar, who was a famous Scottish preacher, well-loved, and he wrote several books. 
and he wrote the biography of Robert Murray McChain that I always recommend people to read. But he uh, was a pastor in a little town in northern Scotland, and he had a little cottage. And every morning, when he opened the shutters, because over there they have those old-fashioned shutters, he would open the shutters and would look up to heaven and say, Lord, perhaps today, perhaps today. And then he'd get on with his work. Well, the Lord took him home by death. But he was always waiting for his appearing. And it's interesting that the Lord would say, uh, through the Apostle Paul, there is a crown that Jesus Christ specifically has for those who love his appearing. That means that you walk with the Lord daily, that you are warm towards the Lord, that you long for the Lord, and that you wait for His coming, and you long. And a true believer who actually does meditate and spend time in the Word, the dream for me, and I'm sure for every believer who loves the second coming, is I wish it would happen before I kick the bucket. I would much rather have my body change, boom, in the twinkling of an eye, and go to be with the Lord and forget the old body. But if we have to go through the process of death, He is with us. He'll never leave us or forsake us. But that is an important concept, you know, that we have a home in heaven and then the sure and certain hope of the resurrection, the resurrection from the dead. And the Bible says that we will meet the Lord in the lair together with those who come with Him and their bodies are risen. And we go to be with the Lord forever. Now, when the Lord comes to reign and He rules in the world for those a thousand years and then for all of eternity, we will reign with him, the Bible says. The details get fuzzy at that point. He doesn't tell us as much as we would like. But you know, there's another thing about the second coming and about heaven. So much is actually revealed in Scripture that we should stick with what is revealed and revel in it and talk about it and teach our children. I am so glad because of the death of my dad that my, my mom and the missionaries taught us all the verses about the second coming and about heaven. And you know, it's in you. You don't have to argue. You don't have to read about it. You know it. It's in the Word. In Deuteronomy 29, 29, I believe it is, it says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may obey the words of the Lord. So the things that are not revealed don't try to speculate. Don't waste time speculating. If the Lord wanted us to know it, He would have revealed it. He didn't reveal certain details because He figured we couldn't take it or we wouldn't understand what He's trying to say, whatever His reasons. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. And then in 1 Corinthians 4, it says very clearly, the Apostle Paul, again, by the Holy Spirit, says, we wanted to teach you, Apollos and I, to not go beyond what is written. Don't go beyond what is written. There's plenty here. Look, there's about 1,200 pages in my Bible. Let's say round figures, 1,000 pages. J.I. Packer one day said this, or he wrote it. He said, I have never yet seen my Lord Jesus Christ, but he has written me a letter. I like that because the Bible is the Lord's letter to you personally. Yes, it's to the church. It's to the world. But in the end, it becomes a personal thing. I have never yet seen, I would add, the face of my Lord Jesus Christ. But he has written me a letter. And I'm going to study that letter and meditate on that letter and enjoy that letter. What a blessing it is that the Lord has chosen to reveal so much. And sometimes we fiddle around at the edges with stuff that is not revealed, trying to speculate, and what a waste of time. And you can get heresies when you do that. So that principle of 1 Corinthians 4, 6 is important to never forget. Don't go beyond what is written. Don't go beyond what is written. The Lord has revealed so much. And so the Apostle Paul is living in this way. And you know, he says in Philippians 1, 23, which we just read, you know how he says, for to me to live is Christ. He just said to them, I don't know whether the Lord's going to leave me on earth. And if he does, I don't know how long. He says, I, I, I may be killed or I may be given a few more years, but either way, I will rejoice. And personally, of course, I'd rather go to heaven. It's amazing. And you know, a true believer lives that way, in two worlds at the same time, holding the material lightly while enjoying it, using it, blessing and using it for blessing. But at the same time, it is material. You know, the things that are visible will pass away the things that are invisible. We look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. 
The things that are seen are temporal. We know they're going to pass, you know, but the things that are unseen, they're eternal. So the believer who is close to the Lord like the Apostle Paul did, we hold both things in both hands and both feet in both worlds, and we enjoy it in both worlds. The unbelievers may sometimes enjoy this world, but they have no hope for eternity. And that's why we're committed, therefore, to evangelize and win them to Jesus Christ. I read a story the other day by a, a Spanish old-fashioned, middle-ages saint. We, we evangelicals don't like to use the word saint, though. Saint is every believer. So you're a saint. I'm a saint. You may not think so, but I am. Uh -huh. Everybody who belongs to Christ is a saint in the biblical sense. But some of them more saintly than others, you know, like the old saying, everybody's created equal, but some are more equal than others. That's not a good biblical statement. But uh, Santa Teresita, they used to call it St. Teresa of Avila in Spain. I read it from the Scotsman, Alexander White, the other day. It said that she had a clock in her where she lived and worked that every hour would strike the hour. And on every hour, she would get so excited and she would say, an hour closer to seeing him. And she started dancing and clapping her hands for a few seconds. An hour closer to seeing him. And, you know, you wish that we had that attitude, you know? Every day that goes by, an hour closer, a day closer to seeing him. She was apparently people who know her and wrote about her madly in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. And she had a, a group of nuns, of sisters, you know, they were believers in those days. Uh, it wasn't a dead thing. And she would just clap her hands and dance around when the clock struck 12, and when it struck 1, and when it struck 2. That was her style, you know. I don't recommend it in New York City necessarily, unless you go to the men's room and do it to yourself. But wherever we are, the idea that the Lord... And then, you know, when you know what the Lord is doing, your sense of despair is much alleviated when what we call tragedies happen. I remember Pat and I, when we were at the campaign in uh, Orlando, I spoke on heaven that night. And I used a phrase that I picked up from J. Vernon McGee. Have you heard that radio program? Who's been dead 40 years, but being dead yet speaketh, as the Bible says, <laughs> quotes about somebody. Anyway, he said this phrase that we have used again and again, and I used it on the radio, and we get so many people responding. A brief life is not an incomplete life. A brief life seems brief to us. It seems like he was cut off before their time, we say. But who decides what their time is? We think that we have, so to speak, the right to live 70, 80, or whatever, our choice. But the Lord knows. And you know, for the believer, there's great comfort when you know that a loved one who loves Jesus Christ goes straight to heaven. And so I want to finish by telling you this, and I hope these passages bless you too. One of them is in Santa Cruz, California, we were having our festival the very week of 9-11, the week following 9-11. The country was still in a panic. Airplanes were empty, all sorts of stuff. Try and remember what it was like. We were having the festival on the beach in Santa Cruz, California. And uh, uh, Fred came to my room on Sunday morning and he said, Luis, something happened last night. The family in charge of cleanup on the beach, Mr. and Mrs. and two teenage girls, the only children, two little girls, 14 and 16, had a crash last night on the way home at 11. A drunken woman hit their little car with an SUV with three kids in the back of her SUV. The two teenage girls were killed on the spot. The dad is in bad shape. The mom is a little better. I said, let's get dressed and go to the hospital. So we went over to the hospital. When I walked in, the nurses said to me, you can't see mister. His head is double its size and he's drugged out so he won't hear you anyway. But missus, maybe you can. So we went to missus's room there and I took her by the hand thinking she's asleep because it looked like she was out too. And the nurse said, she may not know who you are. But I took her hand and she opened her eyes and she said, Louise, you've come. Did you hear what happened last night? You know, I said, yeah, that's why I'm here. And she said, you heard that the girls died, didn't you? I said, yes, I did. And then she said, Luis, think of this. The girls last night saw the face of Jesus for the first time. And I thought, man, that's the way to see it. You see, when you know where you're going, when you know the, what the future holds. But if you don't know, it's up for grabs. Many believers today think, oh, you're going to the grave and God knows what happens next. What a pity. For a long time, I remember we met them and my, one of my sisters lives next, close to them. 
And they said, we forgive her, but we just, no. And the woman wrote from jail. She was in prison somewhere in California, some women's prison. Finally, about three years ago, they went to see this woman in prison. They had an incredible encounter. And you know what they're doing now? They're going to churches, speaking on the platform, telling what happened, and in the process, proclaiming forgiveness to one another and proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. And apparently those who've seen it just fall apart just when they hear the story. But to me, the reason I told you that is that the mother said, think of it, the girl saw the face of Jesus for the first time last night. That is the way to see it. And that's biblical. But if you don't know what's up, then you don't have that kind of hope. It's just one more miserable death and more and more moaning. It's painful, yes, but you know where the person is. And that says, someday I'll see them again. Hallelujah. Billy Graham, I've told you this. I'm sorry, I repeat myself, but I like it anyway. Billy Graham tells about his grandma in North Carolina. She was in bed. In the old days, they sent people to die at home, which is, I think, better than... A hospital. Anyway, she was home, and the family was around the bed. And Billy says that suddenly Grandma, who was 80-something, sat up in bed. She stretched out her arms and said, there's Jesus. And she was gone. And man, that's the way I want to die if I have to die. I'd rather he come in the clouds and take me and leave the old body behind. But you know, that's reality. And I was reading the death of Dwight L. Moody, an evangelist. He had two little grandchildren, a boy and a girl, who had died in childhood. And Mr. Moody was dying. He was young, only 56. It was in 1899. I wasn't there, but almost. And uh, he was dying. And I read the other day that the family was around, you know, all sad and so on, because they could tell he was breathing hard. And then he said something like this. I'll get it in perfect writing. It's in his biography. But he said, if this is death, it's actually wonderful. He said, earth is receding, heaven is coming. And then after a few minutes, he said, I wish I had the names of his two grandchildren. There's Emma. There's Emma. And there's whatever the boy was. And then he went to be with the Lord. I mean, that's the way I want to die, <laughs> you know, but you never know how it's going to happen. But you know how good it is to know about the second coming, to know about heaven, to know what the scripture actually says and not speculate with what it doesn't say. Well, that was the apostle Paul. What a life he lived, huh? And much of what he says about the, he said it from jail. So we're not in jail yet. We should enjoy what the Holy Spirit taught him. The Lord bless you as you go home, meditate on it on the airplane or wherever, and serve the Lord. We'll see you in heaven for sure. I'll look out for you, and you look out for me. We got all of eternity to find each other. There won't be any rush there. But it's wonderful to know that our Savior has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Let's bow our heads in prayer. And as you bow your heads, may I ask you, if you've never received Jesus Christ, or if you don't have the assurance of eternal life, why don't you pray this prayer that I will lead you in? And remember as you pray what Jesus said. Listen, I stand at your door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into you and eat with you and you with me. If you've never made that commitment, why not now and settle it once and for all? And then you can tell your friends or family, I just finally received Jesus Christ. And then remember the word of God in 1 John 5. Listen to this. God has given us eternal life. This life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son of God has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not yet have life. So if you don't have the Son of God, pray this prayer to the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart. O oh God, our Father, thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for his crucifixion in my place. Thank you that you laid on him the sins of us all. And right now, Lord Jesus Christ, I open the door of my heart to you. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. Forgive me all my sins. Disinfect me from all my evil behavior. 
Fill me with your Holy Spirit, O God, and please give me the assurance of eternal life. And I will serve you, Lord, and obey you till I see you in heaven. Amen. Hi, this is Andrew Palau, and I am so glad that you were able to listen to one of Dad's messages today. I love it. We miss him every single day, you can imagine. But the beautiful thing is this. The work that Dad did for God's kingdom has not ended. Of course, we continue to spread the good news all around the world. In fact, we're reaching more people with the hope of Jesus Christ than ever before, day after day. But there's still so many, many people out there who don't yet know him. So the harvest is plentiful. We see that every single day. And we would love your partnership and support and help. And if you'd like to support Palau on this mission, sharing the gospel with every person on the planet, that's our goal. Visit us at luispalau.org, and you'll see how you can do that. Thank you for joining us today. God bless you.